Hi, and welcome to lesson four on unit five, our citizenship unit, where we take a deep dive into the Constitution and how it works. The question today is the teddy bear was named after Theodore Roosevelt. What stuffed animal was named after the president that came after Roosevelt? William Howard Taft. Well, many people don't even really know who William Tower, Howard Taft is, but according to legend, he's the president who got stuck inside a, a bathtub and wasn't able to get himself out. Anyway, he also got himself a stuffed mammal, not a bear. He got a possum. It's pretty crazy, but they used to call it Billy Possum. Needless to say, Billy Possum did not take off like Teddy Bear, and that's why none of us have creepy stuffed possums in our houses. So I'm talking about presidents right now. And that's because last time we talked about Article 1 of the Constitution, which created the legislative branch. Today, we're talking about Article 2, which creates the executive branch. And um, like the executive branch enforces laws. In this case, the executive branch is headed by somebody that everybody in America knows. A person who lives inside this beautiful White House. Of course, t today, that person is President Donald Trump. Anywho. Uh, Donald Trump is the chief executive officer of the United States. His second in command, well, before I say that, actually, um, there have been a, obviously a large number of presidents. Donald Trump is the 45th president of the United States. Wingman is this guy right here. The wingman of the vice president or the second in command would be the vice president. Uh, today, our vice president is Mr. Mike Pence. So, let's talk about some requirements to becoming the President of the United States. The President must be at least 35 years old, be a natural-born citizen. Now, what does that mean, a natural-born citizen? Basically, if you're adopted and sent to America uh, from any country abroad, you are not a natural-born citizen. It's, you have to be somebody who has been born on American soil. Presidents serve two four-year terms. So the vice president, I, I mentioned, is second in command. That's because if the president of the United States is assassinated or unable to perform his duties, the vice president takes control. After the vice president, we have the Speaker of the House, um, and then we also have the president pro tempore of the Senate. You'll notice that there's a lot of other people who are also um, in line to be uh, commander-in-chief if the person above them is killed or unable to perform their duties. But this right here is called the presidential line of succession. And as you can see, there's a lot of folks who are involved in it. If you memorize the entire presidential line of succession, you will get 10 bonus points. It's a pretty crazy thing to do, but hey, why not? So a lot of the folks that were in that presidential line of succession are called cabinet secretaries. Cabinet secretaries belong to the presidential cabinet. On a weekly basis, the presidential cabinet, this is not a place where um, China is kept, meet up uh, in the White House and advise the president. The cabinet secretaries, the leaders of the executive departments, the major ones, and currently there are 15 executive departments that are part of the presidential cabinet. Beyond that, there's about 130 separate uh, federal agencies that are controlled by the President of the United States. He's basically the boss of all of them. You might recognize some agencies on this on this uh, image right here, like the Department of the Interior, or um, the Department of Homeland Security, or the Department of Environmental Protection. All of these branches of the government, or not branches, but agencies, are controlled by the President. And the President nominates the leaders of every single one of them. My favorite would be NRAW 39. Take a look at this. What do you think this agency is responsible for? If you can't guess, take a look at this. This is my second hint. NRAW stands for the National Reconnaissance Organization, and it's basically a spy satellite agency. I think their logo is pretty cool. So how does the president get his or her job? The president is, again, not directed, elected directly by the people. He or she is elected by what's called the Electoral College. The Electoral College uh, consists of a certain number of Electoral College votes per state. And if you look at this map, it looks really similar to the uh, number of representatives for the House of Representatives that come from each state. That's because 
um, the Electoral College is also kind of based off of population. So anywho, there are 538 total Electoral College votes. And ultimately, the way it works is this. Come Election Day in November, every four years, people vote for the President of the United States. Let's take Montana, for example. Hypothetically speaking, if every if the majority of Montanans, 51% and up, vote for President Donald Trump or any Republican candidate or any candidate in general, the three people who are the electors for that state all cast their votes for Donald Trump. Same thing with California. If the majority of people in California vote for a presidential candidate, that president presidential candidate will get all 55 votes and on and on and on. So really the electoral college is kind of based off of the popular vote, but it's not 100% based that way. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Anyway, in order to get elected president, you need to get the golden number. That number is 270 electoral college votes. So do you think it's actually even um, or that the, the each electoral college vote in each state is has, has an equal weight to it. Well, I'm going to show you the populations of California and Montana, and you do the math. 40 million people live in California, and California has 55 votes. 1 million people live in Montana, and Montana has 3 votes. If you divide 55 by 40 million and 3 by 1 million, you're going to get two very different answers. What you're going to realize is that um, the people of California, their vote for president actually counts for less than the people of Montana. It's kind of crazy. This is a map I think that you'll find particularly interesting. This shows voting power by state. And if you look at this map, you'll see a pattern emerge. So states with darker colors are states that have high voting power meaning the number of people in this state um, proportionally is uh, well, proportionally people in these states have more of a say in who gets elected president of the United States. And you'll see that the states that have the most say, the most voter power, are states like Montana, small population states, huge population states like California or Texas or Florida or New York have low voter power when it comes to electing the president. Wyoming is top on the list. It's a very, very sparsely populated state, but keep in mind, they're still guaranteed three electoral college votes. So um, that's kind of how it works. The electoral college, as you can see, really benefits sparsely populated rural areas. Anyway, that wraps up uh, our lesson on the executive branch. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you again.